What if the way you've been telling your life story reveals the secret to what is holding you back? Stories play an integral part in how we see not only ourselves, but the whole world. Stories are more than just an important part of communication. They also reveal hidden aspects of our inner talk, which can either support us or end up holding us back from the very things we want most in life without us even realizing it. Join author, mindset coach, and award-winning singer-songwriter Carrie Rowan on her show, Look for the Good, every Monday at 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. when she shares nuggets of wisdom from her internationally best-selling book, Tell a New Story, Five Simple Steps to Release Your Negative Stories and Bring Joy to Your Life. Carrie's powerful stories and compelling guests will empower you to change how you look at your own life while giving you some powerful tools and tips you can use every day to help you feel better and move yourself closer to the life you've been longing to live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Look for the Good. I'm your host, Carrie Rowan, mindset strategist and coach, and I love sharing nuggets of wisdom about the stories we tell each other, and more importantly, the stories that we tell ourselves. Join me and my special guests as we share our personal stories of strength and triumph every week here on Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. And you can listen online on your mobile device. You can be in your car and just ask Alexa to play Dream Vision 7 Radio. Tune in every Monday at 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern Time to hear real stories and get tips and tools on how to turn your story and your life around. And evolve with us as we unite humankind in universal love. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I'm super excited to be here today. And we have Elizabeth King waiting in the wings. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi. So good to have you on the show today. And as always, we love talking about those stories, especially those stories. Like when a client comes to me and says, you know, I, I just don't think I can share that story. Now I know we're onto something really good, right? That's where the juicy stuff lies in those stories that we think we can't share with anybody. That's where we find once we dig into those stories, what our hidden beliefs are, what really is happening behind that story? What are our intentions with that story? And there's so much that bubbles up when we start to do this work and we look at our stories. And I'm really excited to introduce Elizabeth. We have so much to talk about. And let me tell you a little bit about her background because she's a very interesting background. So Elizabeth is a certified international fertility expert and founder and CEO of the Fertility Coach Academy, who helps people of all backgrounds on their path to conception to have healthy pregnancy, healthy baby, and carry to term. After having three children of her own at the age of 41, Elizabeth believes taking a more holistic approach in the key is the key to success when attempting to conceive. And as a master certified IC, ICF life coach, birth and bereavement doula, and new parent educator, she has helped thousands of women achieve their dreams of conception and parenthood in 21 countries around the world. That's impressive. She supports clients through natural fertility, infertility, IVF, miscarriage, loss, early pregnancy, PTSD, and new parent support. And I'm so excited to have you on the show today, Elizabeth. Welcome to Look for the Good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to have our chat today as well. Absolutely. And you and I spoke before, and I'm just so fond of the work that you do. And, you know, we all know a lot of people struggle with this. And, you know, it's it brings me back to the whole concept of creativity. And we talked a lot about creativity because what you're really getting people to do and to tie into and to really dig into that creative flow in our lives, right? And I feel like for fertility, obviously, we think about creating the most incredible thing, another human being, right? Like it's impressive. Mm -hmm. And as a mom, I totally get that. And it gives me chills. Um, talk a little bit about creativity in general. How does that tie into the very specific creative work that you do? I often hear people say, you know, I'm not a creative. I, I don't feel like I am creative. And I was one of those people, still am, quite honestly, mo more days than not. But I think what connects the what I do to creativity and how we pass that on to other people is this innate ability for our body and our minds and our souls to create every day. And when we think of the typical creative person, we think, oh, they're a singer songwriter or they're a painter or whatever it may be. And you don't have to be that in order to know that you have this ability to create. The more that we show up and create in our world, whether that's with Play-Doh on my 
desk, which I used to have quite often. And <laughs> again, not being a really creative person, my extent of that was little snowman because it was like you could roll <laughs> up a ball and that was it. But that was, again, me showing the universe, God, well, myself, that I was able to create something. And uh, in all kinds of ways, the more you show up in your world with this intention of, wow, I am such a creator. I can create a flower bed. I can create a recipe. I can create a spreadsheet. I can create a relationship. I can create a business, a book, a whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. It's really embedding into our mind, heart, and soul that you have this ability to create that then gives the signal to your reproductive system. I can create, I have the ability to create and it's giving that message to them. We hear so many messages outside of our world about, well, if you're over 35, you're going to have trouble conceiving. Mm -hmm. um, if you know, and of course I see thousands of women that are under 35, quite honestly, that have trouble. So it's certainly not in my world you know, an age thing. But at the same time, once we start to step into that, it breaks down the barriers for yourself to know, I am able to do this. Maybe I need some assistance. Maybe I need to figure out something else that might be going on, but I, I can do this. I have the ability to create. I love that. That's so powerful because it it's one of those, I'm going to bring it back to the story. It's one of those little stories we tell ourselves. And what you said, I hear from clients all the time. Oh, I'm not creative. Well, actually we're all created by, we're creative by nature, right? That's just right. in our nature. It's in our DNA. And just like you gave a lot of examples, people forget that they do stuff all the time. That's creative, making a beautiful dinner. Like you said, making your house beautiful, setting a pretty table. You, everybody just has a different way that they create. And I love that. Doesn't mean that you have to be a painter, like you said, or a singer or something like that. That's the intimidating stuff that we all go, Oh, I can't do that. Right. Right. But bringing it down to the daily, you could create a to-do list. You can create journaling in the morning and just create something on a piece of paper. It doesn't matter what it is. So right. I love that you're really shifting people's mindset and you're getting rid of that story that says I'm not creative. Right. And I do this with my children that are quite young too, with anything that they do. I love what you just created there because it's programming them to know that they, they are creative, whether or not one of them is a really good drawer or not is irrelevant. That's not what we're talking about when we say create, it's all kinds of things. And I think we're just trying to change that narrative for everybody that it looks different than what we may have been programmed ourselves to think, as you said, like if you're not a sculptor, if you're not a painter, if you're not, you know, this amazing drawer, which I was not. And so I think we, we get in our heads, if we're not fitting in this box, then we don't equate to that. Mm -hmm. And that's that. just not true. It's so not true. And it's so empowering. I love what you're doing. It's a little NLP that you're kind of yes. planting in your, in your kids' heads. <laughs> like, uh, look what you're creating, you know, like, because it's empowering. It's so disempowering to tell yourself that you're not creative because it goes against who we are as people mm -hmm. and our spirit and our souls. Like, yes, we are, you know, and so you're really resisting your natural tendency. So, and I love that you get at it in a different way. You know, it's kind of like the art therapies and the music therapies and all these things that are really just designed to get people back in touch with themselves. That's really what they're doing. For sure. And I think traditionally people think I need, you know, if I'm going through something tough, I should journal or I should meditate or, you know, something else that may not feel in alignment with you during that time. I've been through those periods where I'm like, I just, I can't even get my head around meditating. And then I feel bad because I'm doing it wrong, you know, so it becomes a spiral. But buying a, you know, go to the dollar store and buy a coloring book and crayons and have that near your desk or something and spend two minutes just doing that. And you'll see these barriers of yourself, whatever it is that you're going through, really, whether it's fertility or something else, start to break down. It's, it's actually hard for it to live in the same space mm -hmm. of the anxiety of whatever you're going through, as well as being creative, which is why we really push people to do something like that. Now, if journaling and writing and meditation is your way of feeling good in those moments, by all means, continue to do that. Mm -hmm. But I just want to always let people know there's other ways of reaching that same point that we're trying to encourage rather than the traditional senses mm -hmm. of that. 
I love it. I started doing this creativity um, with a friend of mine who happens to be an incredible artist, but she thinks she's not like she can just whip <laughs> off a like a watercolor. And I'm I come over and look at it. I'm like, that's incredible. She's like, oh, I just copied it off of Pinterest. I'm like, do you know what mine Beautiful. would look like if I just copied it off of Pinterest? <laughs> right. That's how I would be, too. <laughs> yeah. It's like not really that great. So we've started to have these creative play dates together. Right. So I was trying to encourage her to do self-care and said, you know, set up all her stuff. Keep it out, because that's one of the things. If you put it all away, it's not going to get done mm -hmm. out of sight, out of mind. Keep your painting stuff out. So then we started getting together and now she's teaching me painting. And then my daughter started a company who she was going through some anxiety, graduating college and just that stage. She started coming and painting and we all started feeling better. And then Fun. it just became this weekly thing. And then one day I didn't feel like painting. So I got the coloring book and I just started coloring. Like you just said, it doesn't matter what you do. It's just the act of doing it and getting the mind to calm down and really just kind of calm that whole nervous system down by the colors and thinking about all the senses that, that get brought up into the creativity piece. Right. We live such a life that it doesn't allow for that on a day to day as far as the to-do list, as you mentioned, is very tactical and, you know, staying in that side of your brain for most of what we do every day. So kind of practicing and getting that muscle engaged is really helpful. I agree. And I always love to think about the movement piece, right? So like your, your mm -hmm. pen to paper or, you know, it's the kinesthetic piece. And I always tell people to journal, don't journal on your computer. We type there and look at screens all day, get a piece of paper and a pen and, and put that to the paper. It, it makes a real big difference. And you're connecting everything, mind, body, spirit. And it's the same thing, you know, it, having movement involved. If, if creating something for you is just putting on your radio and dancing, then I'm all for that, a dance party for one, right? Just to get everything for moving. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I love that. I really love that. Talk to me a little bit about, I, I love, tell me your personal story. We want to hear your personal story. Three babies after the age of 41. Like mm -hmm. I remember being pregnant with my second and I had my babies real close together and I was going to turn 35 and, oh, you would think like an atomic <laughs> bomb was going off there. Oh, you're going to need this and that, right? The whole panic. And like, I'm right. super like, more natural. And I was not buying into the panic, but talk a little bit about your story. I know everybody wants to hear that. Yes. I mean, I think that panic still exists. Sadly, I think the, the needle of that is moving more and more because I say it's, it's certainly not uncommon for someone over 40 to have children. Now, I think it's, it's actually quite common. The, the one thing that might be a little bit less common is three children over 41 is where you don't see as often. Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm pushing to wait till you're 40 because there's definitely risks that come with that. Um, and we do know that our eggs age as we do. So, however, my big message around that though, is we do have the ability to affect change in our body. We do have the ability to affect change in our eggs. That is not something that was ever told to us growing up. It was at least my story that I was always told by doctors is when I was going to freeze my eggs and I'll get back to that, but you're 36, your eggs are 36 years old. You're 40 now, 40 year old eggs, et cetera, right? Now, yes, that's true, but we have also seen, I always use Jane Fonda as the example. We've <laughs> seen how beautiful she is for her age and how well she's aged. Uh -huh. She doesn't look the same as your average other however old she is 80 or or younger i'm not exactly wow, she sure. 80 oh that's making me feel she's old. somewhere <laughs> around there um but you everybody's body is different right mm -hmm. and the more that we know about our body the more that we know what we can do to affect change we now know that yes age is there but the real culprit is inflammation in our body so as we get older we have more inflammation in our system so if we can know our body really well and know what foods what things cause inflammation for us, we can affect change to our cells, not only the mitochondria in our eggs, but also everything in our body, right? So that you can say, okay, that woman actually looks really good for her age because she's probably doing a lot more than meets the eye than the average person. There's also a big thing about genetics, of course. You know, there's some people that they are just blessed with good <laughs> genetics and, and that's it. But my story really started actually 
when I was 19, my older sister, who's seven years older than me, was diagnosed with a rare form of cervical cancer. It was a lung cancer cell found in her cervix. No one at the time, and still 27 years later, ha or more now, had survived on the planet from this, this type of cancer. Um, she's in the medical journals for gynecological oncology, et cetera. So this was a really big deal. We were very focused on how do you how do we keep her on this planet versus her big thing at 26 years old was i she had just gotten married six months before i just i never meant that i didn't want to have kids now having been married six months people know they're always like when are you guys gonna have kids how's this gonna happen and they would say we're gonna have fur babies my first thought to her was i'll have a baby for you like that's it that's what we're doing you know no question that was just of course we went to through the process of figuring out you know what her her treatment needed to be etc but at that time i didn't even know what a cervix was i was <laughs> again 19 not even knowing and it was just a matter of how can i help my sister mm -hmm. come to find out you're not able to have a child for somebody who is once you until you've had your own so that was not available for us um but that really put me on this path of women's wellness and recognizing that you know she went in for a regular annual check to get a refill on her birth control and was told you have to have surgery in four days because this is happening with no symptoms wow so since then i've been a big advocate for women's wellness and pushing back on gynecology and all of those things because you know your body and just because you may not be carrying a baby or trying to get pregnant doesn't mean that all of our women parts don't need to be looked at and and really considered all the time so at age 30 i got divorced and i went to that same fertility doctor and said i'd like to freeze my eggs and he said well you're you're young the way that we thaw and freeze eggs at this point is not really the best so hope go out hopefully you'll find somebody and and come back later if you don't um at age 36 i went back still single and said okay i think it's time and he said the technology has changed let's do this so at 36 i froze i retrieved 13 eggs um i was able to freeze 11 of them so i the reason i make that correction is not everything that is comes up during a retrieval is actually mature and able to be frozen um and then i kind of kept that as an insurance policy is what they had said at the time what i wasn't taught at the time and i am a big advocate for teaching people now is what does that mean after you have these 11 eggs that by no means means that you're going to be able to have a baby from these eggs um and so I went about my life. I had a business. I traveled the world. I really didn't think too much of it. I had my 401k and I had my 11 eggs frozen. So I <laughs> kind of thought I was good. I, I wasn't always burning yearning to be a mom either. So it wasn't like I was so desperate to have my child. It was just because of the people that were in my life, it was like the smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mind you, nobody was doing this at this time, 10 plus years ago. Wow. So it, it did give me a sense of relief in the fact that I had that though. Then fast forward to 39, I started to think, okay, maybe I do wanna have kids sometime soon and I need to start thinking about this more and more. Also at that time, my periods had changed. They had become heavier. I was having more cramping than I had. I had always been like clockwork. I had been off the pill for many, many years, just trying not to have any hormones or disrupt my reproductive cycle. Again, knowing what all of that had done, always being involved in my reproductive health. And my OB had said, no, you're fine. I see some small fibroids, but it's not a problem. I had heard about fibroids before. I knew that they potentially could not be a problem, but my intuition thought maybe I need to go back to this fertility doctor and just have that second opinion to see. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, he said, yes, they're small, but they're exactly where you, they would not need to be if you were going to be implanting an embryo. Therefore, you do need to get them removed. So that was another huge mm -hmm. lesson of, you know, 
listening to yourself, your body to know, okay, do I need to just get a second opinion on this? Because yes, fibroids are quite common, but even that you want to make sure that you get that checked out because that's a signal that something is not working properly in your body. So what is the root cause of that, first of all? And second, it matters where they are and size and all of those things. So had surgery at this point. Now I'm four, I'm had just turned 40 and that fertility doctor said, okay, you got to now really start trying because of your age. And so the first month that I was able to, after my uterus had healed, we got pregnant with my first son. I was traveling for work. I was in the Westin in Atlanta and got down on my knees and thanked God after I took those three pregnancy tests in the hotel room. I was, I get goosebumps thinking No, about. you just gave me total goosebumps everywhere. Yeah. Um, I just, I was so grateful. You know, I thought, okay, this is, this is what I needed to have the surgery and it worked. And here we are now building our family and truly, truly felt so blessed. Went on to have a great pregnancy and in that great in the fact that, you know, compared to other people, I was not on bed rest or anything, but pregnancy has never been um, something that was easy for me. So um, went on to knowing that we wanted to have multiple children and got pregnant again after i had a c-section i had to wait at that time six months to to get pregnant again for my uterus to heal and got pregnant not too long after that and then had a miscarriage that first miscarriage rocked my world more than i ever could have thought i just i didn't know anybody who had one mm -hmm. it was never spoken about in our family in fact it was always like my mom saying that she was taken to the priest because she got pregnant too easy um, and here I was thinking, you know, why didn't anybody ever tell me this was so common and why, you know, I felt very betrayed by mm -hmm. people around me and the fact that I was so naive from this first pregnancy that we got pregnant right away, first month, first try after surgery. And now if this was so meant to be, why was it ripped from me right away? So it took me quite a while to come to terms with all of that and, and really seeking help to heal my heart from that process. And in that first DNC, my husband and I were there doing that, which is where they take the fetal tissue out of your body from a surgical perspective. Some people take a pill in order to pass the, the fetal tissue, others do what's called a DNC. So we were doing a DNC and the in the bed next to us, so two feet between us with a fabric drape was a couple that was doing their transfer. So they were getting an embryo put in, I was getting ours taken out. I remember thinking I was so genuinely excited for them, but also my story of what my life was going to look like was being ripped literally from my body at that time. Like physically mm -hmm. pulled out of me. Mm -hmm. And that was the moment that I knew that I had to take my, at that point, 12 year life coaching career and switch that to fertility. Nobody prepares us for this journey of fertility. Nobody educates the public on what to expect, why this is happening. You know, as much as it's common, people weren't talking about these mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. around whether that's fertility, infertility, miscarriage loss, stillborn, et cetera. Absolutely. Generations of families were keeping these things pushed under the rug. Yeah. So it was one of those ex times where the light bulb went off for me of like, okay, this is very clear that we need to be doing this to help other people going through this. That is so powerful. We're going to break real quick. I know everybody's yeah. listening. They're hanging on. They want to hear the rest of your story. <laughs> so don't go anywhere. Everybody will be right back with a quick message. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Look for the Good. And we're here with Elizabeth King. She was sharing. I, I was just kept getting so many goosebumps with her story. And I know you guys were probably too. So share with us the rest of your story. You That's when you got the big light bulb moment of like, wow, I know what I need to do. This is my life's mission. Yes. And it, it's interesting that you say the life's mission, because I truly feel now that when you ask for those signs of what is it that I'm supposed to be doing with my life, you never think that it's going to be coming in that form of with this huge 
difference between what I was going through and the couple next to us was going through. And I'm so grateful for that in hindsight now, but at that time it, it really was the most painful thing I had ever gone through emotionally. I was, yes. The only thing that I can really say to that is the rug was pulled from under me. I, yeah. I went to a therapist at that time that had was supposedly a specialist in miscarriage loss and i because i was so devastated i'm like i really need to get help for this you know and and acknowledge that i remember my husband waiting outside on the curb um in the car and i walked out of there and i was more devastated and crying than i was going in because i was not able to connect with her i wanted somebody to give me hope i didn't know if she had had any kids i didn't know if she had a miscarriage i didn't know anything about her which for most therapists traditionally that's their job is to hold that boundary Mm -hmm. for me as a coach that's never how i've worked i've always worked especially very heart-centered and connecting to the client so that they know that i understand where they're coming from and where they're walking to and again that just reiterated to me that as me being my own client what is it that i needed to heal And I needed to seek out those stories and those people to say, I went through this, you will be okay. You will get to the other side. Here are what you can, here are the things to help you heal that and to grieve properly and to not only heal your emotional wounds, but your spiritual wounds as well. And that's a whole nother conversation. But I think back to my point about families leaving this under the rug for generations, that's also something that I see so much in my practice of the blocks that people have for from their subconscious mind are not only not always from their own blocks. They could be from their lineage, their grandparents, great grandparents, things that their partner has gone through and their family, et cetera. And so sometimes taking the time to peel back that onion to say, is this theirs or does it belong to someone else? And is that what's preventing these babies to come through in a healthy way and to stay, so to speak? Because it's one thing to get pregnant, but it's another thing to have that live birth. And um, unfortunately, I've seen that many times in my practice as well as Mm -hmm. my experience myself. So to fast forward through my story, I ended up having two more children. We did freeze my eggs after my second loss to hope that maybe, you know, maybe it was my 42 year old eggs that weren't good anymore that the doctors kept telling us. I was, we went to four different fertility doctors to get second opinions of different things. Um, One which said you need to have an egg donor. I'm very for egg donation, sperm donation. I think it's amazing that we live in a world that we could do that. I just knew for me, I didn't need that. And they weren't even willing to look at my medical history other than the fact of my age to just be so quick to say, you need Mm -hmm. to go to egg donation. So I continued forward. I found a doctor that I knew would work with me and know that I could do this. I had this knowing I was meant to bring these three three little beings into the world. And, you know, much to many people's dismay, why would you do this? You have one healthy baby, you're 42 years old, you're 43 years old. And I knew I needed, I I had this knowing, and that's Mm -hmm. what I say to people. Do you have that knowing inside of you? Okay. That's half, that's half the battle right there. You know that you have this ability to create, you know, that you're meant to be a mom. We just got to figure out the path for you to do that. And you find your fertility team who's going to help you get there and who's going to support you. And in the meantime, the people that are not willing to kind of be on your team during that period, it's about self-preservation. You need to have that one track mind for that time period. And then you can revisit the people that may not be super supportive. But yeah, yeah, we went on to having (laughs) the two more. And my last, I was just about to be 44. So we had them three and three years pretty quick. The losses in between, but I you know, in hindsight, wouldn't change the story because it's helped me connect with so many people. It is so beautiful and chill inducing. And I love that you bring the whole mind, body, spirit into everything because it is, it's all connected, right? And it's like, what do you really believe about what's possible? And you never gave up that hope. You always just knew. And if somebody didn't give it to you, you moved on to the next person. But I, I, I do feel like, and I've interviewed so many people as I'm sure you have too, the best businesses start like this. 
they start out of something, a need, what you're down on your knees and you're not getting what you need. And then you can discover in your mind, okay, here's what I want to do. Here's how I want to help people. And that is so powerful. And I say to people all the time too, I'm sure you do too. It's there's space for everyone. And, and, you know, when I started life coaching in 2008, there were, it was very few and far between people were like, oh, you're probably from California. You're a life coach and eat sushi. <laughs> like, you know, and I was like, that kind of how is how it was <laughs> right and now. There's life coaches everywhere and there is always space for more. And if you find your calling of what you feel, even if that changes in a few years, if there's something now that you could feel helpful to someone and it doesn't necessarily mean you need to do it as a business, that's okay. You can do it as volunteer or just by helping somebody. Most coaches, especially I say, you know that you're your coach. You're that person in your friend group or your family that everybody comes to. Mm -hmm. You give advice. You are able to hold that sacred space for somebody. And it's just a matter of figuring out what that right direction is for you to, to go on to make that what it is that you, whatever you want it to be. I love that. I just, there's so much that you said that just really resonates. And yeah, I love that you say there's space for everybody. Cause a lot of times people have a scarcity mindset, like, Oh, there's too many coaches. I can't get involved in that. Well, if it's mm -hmm. something that you feel passionate and deeply about, and we all bring our own special, whatever that gift is that God gave us, right? We bring that into what we do and nobody can do it the way that I do it or the way that you do. And that's the beauty of it. That's why it just keeps expanding because people need just that very special thing that only you can offer them. Absolutely. And when it's tied to a personal story and you're so personally invested, I feel like that is just, it catapults you into wanting to help, wanting to be of service. And nowadays, you know, you can, you can have the most successful business in the world. You can have all the money you want. Maybe you have a corporate job or there's that feeling of dissatisfaction, which is what I see in a lot of women kind of at that midlife stage where they're like, okay, I did that. I did the business thing, but there's something so much more that I want to give back. And that's right. where true happiness and satisfaction comes from, I believe. I agree. I always say I could talk to the wall all day about fertility and all the things and spirit babies and everything that I love. If somebody wants to come and listen, great. If I can help someone along the way, amazing but it is really what lights me up personally. And I think that's where you know you found your space when you can light that up within yourself just alone. Yeah. Yeah. Without and that, anybody watching. Yeah, exactly. It, it's that passion, right? But it's more than passion. It, it's really a calling. Like I said, a mission before it's mm -hmm. a calling. It's that knowing it's that same knowing you had that said, I know I can use my eggs. I know that I can have these babies. I know I was meant to. And I think a lot of times in this world that we live in right now, we're so externally focused and we listen to all the experts and the gurus and mm -hmm. we take everybody else's opinion over our own. And I love that you said that, you know, I'm always talking to my clients about bringing it back to, do you have enough quiet time in your life? Are you making space so that you can actually really contemplate something instead of just consuming or just these consumers. Now right. we're consuming all this social media and we're consuming so much that our minds are on overload and on stress mode. And when we can find that time and really tune in, like, how do you teach people to really listen to themselves? Do you give them any advice on that? I mean, that's a big thing with my clients because a lot of people on social media share the good, bad, and the ugly, right? And I always say, find that social evidence of what it is that you're looking for, because you can find it. You can mm -hmm. find it either way, right? If you're looking for somebody over 40 who's had three kids naturally, I'm your girl. If you're looking for somebody over 50 who's used as an embryo you know, donor, you can find that. Once you find that, make peace with that and shut it down because you need to keep those blinders on like a horse that's going because otherwise, you, you get programmed, you can't unsee or unread some of those things that you see. And it's mm -hmm. not helpful for us on the journey, right? As, especially with fertility, you'll self-diagnose based on what Susie Q said on her post and think maybe I need to be doing this crazy thing that she may be doing, but you don't know her medical history. You don't know her spiritual history. You don't know all the things that go into making that person them. 
So really, again, going back to just staying in your lane, put the blinders on, know that it is possible for you and rest at that and then build your fertility team, whatever that looks like, whether that's your partner, whether that's your friends and family, whether that's a coach and a doctor, whatever it may be, those people that are going to then build up for you what you need to have your path to parenthood. And again, it may look different than you expected, but you can always find the social evidence that's going to show you that it's possible. Right now in this world of fertility, it's incredible. There are so many ways to to have a baby, which is magnificent. Um, It's just a matter of finding you and your spirit baby, connecting the both of you and figuring out how you're going to get there together. So I think it's really an amazing time. And the the possibilities are endless. And there's so many modalities that can help you with uh, acupuncture, um, psych K, EFT, there's so many different things that can help break down the blocks. If you have nothing physically wrong. Now that's a big other thing people are diagnosed with unexplained infertility very often. That could be a blessing and a curse for some. It's helpful sometimes to know I I have XYZ diagnosis and then you can deal with that when you have unexplained it feels a little frustrating because you're like I'm doing all the things. Most people that come to me are very type A. They've checked all the boxes. They know all the things about their their bodies and everything. And that's where we really dig in to say, where is it that you may have a block? Where do you need to go for a second opinion? Because not all doctors necessarily are created equal. Some specialize in one thing or another, even within fertility. And it's helped to have that guide to show you, hey, try this doctor in New York or call this doctor in San Diego. Just have the consult. They specialize in low ovarian reserve. They specialize in donor conception, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's very helpful to to just have a starting point and keep the blinders on for your own path because you're going to get there way faster than taking in the noise of everything and everyone around you with social media. So I talk about the, the social media diet is really the big advice that I give my clients. A low social media diet. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> low social. Yeah, we just did a... Uh... I just had a guest on and we, the whole show was about the comparison problem, like how oh, yeah. devastating that is to us. So, and I also love what you said about, you know, you can find what it is you're looking for. So you can find the supportive stuff. And if you believe in that, it's not going to happen. You can find that easily too. So it's for whatever, sure. right. Whatever we're programming that RAS of our brain to look for. Um, so we're going to break real quick. I know you guys want, can't wait to hear some more from Elizabeth. So come right back. We'll be right with you. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Look for the Good. We are having such an amazing conversation here with Elizabeth King, and we are talking about all things fertility, but we're really talking about a lot of mindset, and we're talking about how to empower yourself. And we just ended, we were talking all about you can find anything you want out there, right? You can find what it is that you believe is true, because there's a lot of you know, we don't have to go into the science behind it, but, you know, our brain will try to find what it is that we believe is true for us. So um, talk to us a little bit about the mindset. We've talked a little bit about that, where you're talking about put the blinders on, get focused, get your team, talk a little about uh, a little bit about the individual mindset. And what if somebody does have that little sneaky story in there that somebody told them once a long time ago, you'll mm-hmm. never get pregnant or you can't get pregnant. I had a friend who somebody told her, you can't get pregnant. Uh, something was wrong with her ovary or something and you, you won't get pregnant. She got pregnant on her honeymoon. Like, okay, so that mm-hmm. there goes that theory. So talk right. a little bit about that mindset. Yeah, I mean, the mindset is huge. There was a Harvard study that was done that if you were doing the any sort of therapy around fertility, you're 55% more likely to conceive. That's a huge, huge number. Wow. Uh, So when I say that the mindset matters in fertility, it's not just, I mean, Harvard can back you up. And if there's any study to do that, I'm happy to keep pushing that. And the other side to that, that I like to equate that with too, is you're not going out of your mind if you're struggling with your mindset during fertility. The Mayo Clinic did a study that shows somebody going through fertility is the same stress level as a cancer patient. So again, that validates your mindset if you're struggling. And that's why it's okay to ask for help when you're going through this. It's almost expected. And if you're thinking that you can do it yourself, 
there's nothing, no shame in asking for help. It's a short period of time and you will be more successful with your mind, body and spirit and getting to your baby sooner if you get that help. So that is the biggest part of the coaching aspect that I work with is the mindset. First, we do go through what you're eating, what you're not eating, um, go th over your medical labs. Is there any red flags that we have noticed? What's your history? How many times have you, how often have you tried to get tr pregnant naturally? Have you tried IVF or anything else? Mm -hmm. So we do go through all those kind of nuts and bolts, so to speak. I'm not somebody who shies away from the medical community. I think we need that to know, are we on the right track? I always say we get the lay of the land. Just because you go see a fertility doctor does not mean you're signing up for IVF. It means they're gonna check, are your tubes open? Is your uterus clear? Is everything good? I've had clients that have been trying for three years only to know that their tubes were blocked. It was never gonna happen for them. Wow. So it's really important to get that lay of the land. And then we start with the, the mindset, it's, which is, so powerful. I always use the example of somebody who's anorexic, unfortunately, their mind and the thoughts that they have get them to a point of such sickness that they can be hospitalized. Those are just from their thoughts. That is extremely powerful. So if we're having thoughts when we're trying to conceive that are not helpful for us, that's just playing against what we're trying to get at. So if we can work with somebody that can help to make us aware that our thoughts create our feelings, our feelings create our actions, our actions create our results. And I know sometimes that seems very straightforward when we're saying it. And when you work with a coach that can work with different modalities, sometimes it's so easy to go through these models with clients. Sometimes we work through Psych K, which is unblocking the subconscious blocks. That's a little bit different. Sometimes we bring in spirit babies to to hear what's going on sometimes we work with the lineage stuff to see if there's something else that doesn't belong to us so the mindset work comes in many many different forms it can be happen it can heal itself really quickly for some it can extend based on it sometimes unravels something else like you mentioned earlier, I have one client recently that had a memory of I was watching a show when I was 13 years old babysitting of someone who wasn't able to have a baby. And she's like, she had this aha moment. I remember thinking, maybe I won't be able to have a baby. So that was her moment that we need to, needed to unblock that, that programming that she took in, that she wasn't even aware that she was taking in some random show as she was babysitting somebody else. So it looks many, many different ways for people. And I think that's the beauty of working with somebody who's willing to ebb and flow with how you need to be worked with during your journey, because we're not all cut from the same cloth. We all have a different story. We all come to the table in our own unique, beautiful ways. But with fertility, we're all after the same end result. So those emotions that we're having, the experiences that we're having, the nervousness, and if you've had any sort of loss, the PTSD, that's a real thing. People, there's very few other situations in life that you are told you have to go back to the scene of where you saw something or someone die we need to go back to that same medical table get in a very vulnerable position laying down on the table and see what's happening inside of us time and time again that's really triggering for a lot of people when they get pregnant get pregnant again after a loss of how do I know there's going to be a heartbeat this week or whatever it may be. So having somebody hold your hand through that process is really helpful, empowering, just comforting, really. And even though many people that I see have very supportive partners, oftentimes those partners just don't know what to say in those moments. They don't know how to help navigate you through that not for lack of trying and lack of love of course not they they just want to make it better they just want to see you happy again they just want to be with you with that baby in your arms and so again having somebody to help with that mindset and bring all of those things together the mind body emotional aspects to that really is priceless and something that i wish i had had my husband will tell you He's like, we would have taken out a loan on the house if we knew somebody could have helped with, with the process. Because I remember getting my blood taken and that poor phlebotomist at the fertility clinic, I was crying. She doesn't know what to say. You know, it's not her job. 
but the emotions are so heavy and so real and you just want to get answers and you just want to understand what's going on and having that in a intermediary between the doctor and your yourself is really helpful. So helpful. I mean, I, and so just having somebody who's been there, you know, it's just, it's, it's really powerful on a lot of different levels and you don't really realize what you need necessarily until you've been in the situation and you've stumbled on some of these roadblocks. And that's why I love so much what you do because it comes from the heart. It's totally from the heart and the way you're able to stand by them and help them pick the team. And really, um, you know, I feel like some coaches are, are really sort of, you know, they have a process that you got to pull people through. And it seems like your process is just very fluid. We're going to figure out what you need and then we're going to create a process for you because we're all individuals. Absolutely. It's almost completely opposite of that. It's, it, it has to flow because that's the nature of creating the life, right? Where everything has to be in the right timing. If we were to go in a very structured model of coaching, that would not be serving the people that are there. I always say you could have one day where you're feeling good. The next day someone looks at you wrong and you're hysterically crying. And in the way that I coach, we are holding your hand through it daily because those ups and downs during the fertility journey we're, are gonna ebb and flow. And it's not like our appointments on Tuesday at two o'clock and then in between, we don't, we don't communicate. We're there for you through the good, bad, the ugly, celebrating those wins and holding your hand and sending you a hug when you get the bad news. So it definitely is very different than most traditional coaching. Oh yeah. Big time. And, and I love that piece of it. And again, like I said before, the mind, body, spirit, because it is, we're all that you're, you're calling another spirit down into, you know, the whole situation. So mm -hmm. I love that piece. Tell us a little bit about the spirit baby before we have to wrap up. Yes. Um, so th it's amazing. I, I get downloads from spirit babies more and more recently in the last year than I had before. Um, and basically I get these messages from these little ones i always kind of go here because they're always like kind of on the shoulder so to speak and giving messages of whether it's just yay i'm excited you're talking to my mommy right now to no. um messages about they don't like where they live and they they want the parents to move out of the city to somewhere quiet before they can be conceived to um messages from ones that have they've had siblings that have passed on that they're being watched on there's i mean, I can go on and on about all these amazing um messages that i've received from them and it's i always say if there are specific people that just do spirit baby readings mine come in as i'm talking to them so i get these hits from the babies as i'm having a conversation with somebody so we could be talking about your inflammation and then i get full body chills from starting from my head all the way down to my knees and i know that i'm starting to get a message from their their little one. And um, so we just pause, see what messages come through, and then move back on to our session. Different from people who do only spirit baby readings, where you can sign up for an hour and and talk to your, your baby that's waiting for you. So there's a lot of different ways that you can communicate with them. And um, we are in the process of putting something together to help people to communicate with their spirit babies more easily. So they know that it's, it doesn't, you don't have to be anyone special in order to connect with that energy that's, that's there waiting for you. That's so cool. I got a full body chill when you were talking about that. That's really yeah. cool. But I think my baby days are over, but that's really. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe grandbabies are around. <laughs> that is so cool. I mean, there's so many levels of goodness of what you're doing and you know, as we love to look for the good here, um, is helping somebody get through those times, you know, and when it seems like it's, it's endlessly not going the way that you want it to, that there is hope and you're offering that very hope that you were looking for that one time. And that's yeah. a really, really beautiful thing to give back in that way. So tell them where can they find you? Where can they find out more? Yes. So my website, elizabethking.com, Instagram, the official Elizabeth King, my podcast, Creation Innovation, 
you can find us anywhere. There's always somebody on the other end that will get to me. And most often you'll hear a voice memo back from me because I'm the queen of voice memos. So <laughs> <laughs> we love to hear from you. We love to hear your stories. We love to hear your struggles, your wins, all of the things. Um, sometimes it just helps to to let that out to someone on the other end, whether we ever connect as a coach or not. But I'm here to to listen and to give whatever you need back. I love that. And tell us a little bit, you, you train other people to do this. Tell us a little bit about your academy before we sign off. Yeah. The Fertility Coach Academy is a certification program for people that are wanting to help other people on their fertility journey. So what I had noticed is a lot of people were saying, well, I went through my own fertility journey. And so therefore I'm now a coach. That's great. You can certainly do that. What we do is we curate information so that from the scientific information with sperm and egg and, and down to very cellular, the nature of all of those things to coaching, how you do that, how you start a business, et cetera, et cetera. And we package that all together in the Fertility Coach Academy. We also have a really amazing community of other coaches and we help everyone move forward, not only to be coaches, but how to be successful in their own business and in helping others at the same time. And it doesn't mean that you have to have had your own fertility journey. We have a lot of nurses that have gone through the program, a lot of people that have gotten pregnant naturally and they just love everything around fertility and pregnancy and all of the things. So if you're feeling called, most people don't even know that fertility coaching is a thing. Yes, it is a thing. It's unfortunately fertility is such a growing industry and will become more and more as the times that we're in, but um, you are needed. If it's something that is calling you, please, please check us out. We'd love to have you join us. Love it. That's fabulous. Really, really fabulous. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Elizabeth. You are just a wealth of information. Thanks for having me. It has been so fun. Yes, super fun. I love it. And you guys remember where to find her, elizabethking.com and find her on Instagram as well and all the links. And, um, and listen, if you are loving this and you love my podcast, you following and you're loving what Elizabeth has to say, go to my website. And if you want more goodness in your inbox, if you want to get little insider tips on some things we talked about, aside from what we did here today, you'll find them all in your mailbox. If you want more goodness there, go sign up for my newsletter and it's called Goodness Grooves. It's all about what we talk about here. So go to my website at carryrowan.com, C-A-R-R-I-E-R-O-W-A-N.com. You know how to spell it, but we love spelling things here on radio. So thank you everybody for tuning in today. And thanks again, Elizabeth. Loved having you here. And remember, it is never too late to live your best story. Be well. Thanks for tuning in to Look for the Good with your host, Carrie Rowan, best-selling author and mindset coach. Join us every Monday at 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. right here at Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. If you weren't able to catch an episode, no worries. Just visit our website to find all the archived episodes of Look for the Good on demand so you don't miss a thing. And remember, it's never too late to live your best story. For additional resources or to find out about how you can work with Carrie directly, visit CarrieRowan.com for more details.